So, we now get to find out the topic of my brown talk. And there was a reason I didn't tell the topic, and it wasn't just to be obnoxious. So, the topic of my brown talk is expectations. And you probably came in with a few of them, you know, that I was probably going to talk about my adventures at the Lemur Center, or maybe my other interests. But no, we're talking about expectations themselves. So there's a lot of interesting science behind uh, your relationship to expectations and how you perceive the world, and even your actions thereafter, um, that really deals with the subconscious. And a lot of things you wouldn't even think would factor into why you do things. So a lot of it's about um, kind of the placebo effect. And because you expect to get better on the placebo, your body naturally produces endorphins, which will um, fight pain, will block a lot of pain, and you'll automatically feel better, basically because you are planning, planning up, because the stress levels go down in your body. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool, but it gets even a little bit more interesting when you start thinking about the social impacts of the power of expectation. So there's something called the Pygmalion effect, and this is a test that some scientists did with um, with a school. So they had all the kids in a first grade class take an IQ test, and they got all the scores. And randomly, they told the teachers that a certain number of kids were going to have dramatic increases in IQ. Um, within the next year and within the next few years. And this was not based by the IQ scores that the kids rep represented. This is based by random. So you have kids that have, you know, really high IQs to start and really low IQs to start. And what they found is that all of the kids experienced a huge bump in IQ um, just after telling the teachers that these kids were going to. And they sort of, they, they decided to break it down. And they found that teachers were more willing to invest time in those kids that they thought were going to be um, stellar, even though they showed no reason to be so. And they give them more time to answer questions and they give them additional help. So this all sort of culminated into, you know, kids that had a greater expectation that they were going to do well, so they were pushed more academically and also had more time invested into them so they'd learn more. So that that provides a really interesting sort of case for what our prejudices and preconceptions can influence in the behavior of ourselves and in others. Um, if you expect that somebody's always going to be a bad apple, maybe they, you know, maybe because they feel that expectation on them, they're going to react more negatively towards you. And you know, why why is why does that kid always slacking on the project? Well, did you expect the kid to slack on the project and treat them as a slacker? Maybe. So expectations can also cloud judgment in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, so whenever, for instance, they did studies with wine tasting, and if you see the cost of a wine, you'll automatically judge that wine to be tastier. But in blind tests, a lot of times, the five-buck chuck will outperform the $60 fancy Chardonnay um, that you had previously said was the tastiest of the bunch. This also gets even weirder when you um, do comparisons of faces. They did studies, um, and people were judging the attractiveness of faces on a scale of 1 to 10. And if they, if they didn't, but they would also have um, the peer, the peer judgment at the bottom of the page with the face. And the results the second time around, when they could see the peer judgment as well as the face, always tended to correspond with the, with the peer judgment, even if previously they had rated faces much differently. So... Who knows? Do you ex what do you expect to find when you look at somebody? Do you expect to see what you see or what you think others see? Perhaps a little bit of both. However, the real use for
for expectations is, of course, sports. Because we are in blue double territory. So, I don't know if you guys remember the scene in Harry Potter where Harry pretends to give Ron some lucky juice in his potion, in his, in his orange juice before the big game? Well, I certainly do. And so do scientists. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if, if they tell athletes that they have been given a performance-enhancing drug, they, they expect themselves to perform better, and they have an additional boost of confidence, which allows them to, to perform better, just believing that they have an advantage. We've also done this um, with, again, with testing for who, is, who responds best under pressure. And they found that if they tell athletes that based on the personality quiz, they have a personality that corresponds to excelling under pressure, they perform better. So this gets interesting when you think about the real world applications of this. So there was a lot of research going on with the premier soccer teams in England um, that generally put together super strong squads and like the Cameron Crazies have a rabid fan base. So they found that teams, especially when playing on their home turf, had a lower percentage, had really just terrible percentage of uh, penalty kicks made because it's all about it's all about pressure. You know, there's no reason you should miss a penalty kick except when you're that talented except because of being able to deal with pressure. And they found that the best teams were with the on their with all their fans were the worst at the penalty kicks because there was such a huge expectation for them to perform well, to win and to make the penalty kick. Now, here's where we get to apply this to Duke. So, I did a little bit of internet snooping, and I'm not by any means, you know, trying to say that I am an expert on this or compiled extensive lists, but I compared uh, Duke free throw shots to um, all the teams overall. And the teams that had the most players with the highest percentage of shots of, of free throws made, generally belonged to worse teams. Uh, IU, Duke, Michigan, none of those teams had anybody on the top list for percentage shooting at all. And, you know, that could be something that it's related to. The other question is, why do good teams lose to bad teams? And that also has to deal with the power of expectation. When good teams expect to win, they are playing, instead of playing, fighting to win, they're playing not to lose, which gives the lesser, te the, you know, lesser teams who don't expect to win and have nothing to lose at all, they're playing to win. And they can often surpass some more adept teams. Hence, perhaps, the Virginia Duke game. But, so that's a brief outline for how expectations can shape our lives. But here is a real world example. We're gonna have some snacks now. Who would like a snack? Kyle would like a snack. Come get a snack, right. Kyle. because of the Whole Foods, there's no snacks in there. I'll tell you where the snacks are. I've hidden them all around the room. So now you have to find them. So, no, that's not a snack that I've hidden here. So, I guess this concludes our very brief brown talk. Uh, no, I, I didn't hide those either. They're, they're, they're not those. They're this 